So, you know, we, we, we want to talk today about what, what we feel is, you know, society feels is one of the biggest global threats to the internet today. And a lot of folks in Washington are expressing concern about it, but it's in fact not being talked about. So that's one reason why we wanted to come here and, and talk about it. Um, it we, we were founded, the Internet Society, in 1992 by Vint Cerf and other leading um, architects of the, um, of the Internet. And one of our key goals is to defend an open, global, trustworthy, and secure Internet over which people around the world can seamlessly communicate with other people elsewhere in the world. That internet has been placed at serious risk by a surprising entity, the United States government, which prior to last October was one of the leading defenders of an open internet around the world. Um, since at least the Clinton administration and during every Republican and Democratic administration since then, the United States has defended the free flow of information around the world and has resisted restrictions on cross-border data flows, um, resisted um, requirements on data localization. That defense has been primarily implemented through trade agreements, for better or worse, and I'll mention that in a second, but through trade agreements that's had specific provisions that supported cross-border data flows, meant oppose mandated data localization, oppose discriminatory data policies, and oppose national requirements that source code be turned over by um, foreign companies. In October of last year, completely out of the blue, at least to the civil society folks in Washington, um, the United States Trade Representative announced the United States would no longer support these policies, would no longer be pushing these policies in the WTO. And the USTR's argument, as we understood it, as we understand it, is that those trade provisions would supposedly prevent the United States from regulating AI and reigning in big tech. We think those arguments are completely unfounded for two reasons. First, Congress can absolutely certainly regulate AI and big tech without undermining um, the open internet and the relevant trade agreements all have provisions allowing for um, nations to enact valid public policy and national security provisions if they're needed. Um, and there's really no evidence that, um, that trade agreements have in fact obstructed um, the Congress from, from enacting these policies. So, you know, we do appreciate that trade agreements, it's certainly for civil society in Washington where I've been for decades, um, Trade agreements are a somewhat controversial area for public policy because at least civil society is largely excluded from the trade agreement process. Um, um, so it's kind of a black box um, for us. So I, I appreciate um, some of my civil society colleagues that have concerns about the use of trade agreements. But for better or worse, the United States has used trade agreement provisions for more than 25 years to defend and advance the open internet. And they took that away in October. And I'm gonna hand the mic over to my colleague, Natalie, who will kind of walk us through the harmful impacts of what USTR um, has done and um, kind of how it is in fact having an, an impact. Thank you, Joseph. Thanks, everyone. Happy to sit for everyone room here. So the U.S. backing down on protecting and defending the Internet, the open global Internet, is what we see as the biggest threat the Internet is facing right now. It directly undermines the Internet's key promise, and that is that if you can connect to the Internet, you can connect to the world. The Internet just isn't the Internet without the free flow of information online. It's a fundamental principle. It's what it needs to exist in the first place. In the past, the U.S.'s leadership in defending the open internet has played a major factor in its rapid growth and success worldwide. The U.S.'s early foresight to adopt policies that would support an open, globally connected, secure, trustworthy, secure and trustworthy internet has also benefited a strong digital economy, not just here, but around the world. It also helped people worldwide exercise rights of expression and self-determination. But we can't take that for granted. 
Over the years, countries have increasingly been trying to assert dangerous forms of digital sovereignty that threaten the internet's seamless nature. We see both democratic and autocratic countries wanting to control what flows out and into countries and the little masses that have to sensitive information. Until now, as my colleague John mentioned, the prospect of trading with the US has stopped a lot of these uh, dangerous digital sovereignty approaches um, through uh, things like mandated data localization rules and other data flow restrictions. But what happens if we lose the strong protection from cross-border data flows and we start seeing things like forced localization? Our ability to communicate with, another, with one another in countries around the world is at risk. I might not be able to call my kids in WhatsApp in Canada tonight. Should we start seeing some of these ideas take hold? Our ability to do business and offer services online is at risk. And our ability to access information on the global internet is at risk. What happens if you added rules to mandate disclosure of source code? On top of that, people, businesses, and countries alike will be more vulnerable to data breaches, surveillance, censorship, physical harm. The US standing down on protecting the internet from bad decisions such as these is an immediate threat to the internet because it just gave everyone, every country, a green light to move forward with their own approach to digital sovereignty that might undermine the single stage of the internet. We're already starting to see this impact, the impact of this policy shift in different countries around the world. For instance, India, media, India media immediately referenced this policy shift as a validation of the data government strategy, where it can restrict personal data from within its borders from being transferred um, and stored. Just last month, members of the European Parliament were proposing amendments to align its trade set strategy with US policy shift. And you're increasingly hearing about government to government communications and conversations from countries that are expressing a surprise and a very big worry about the UN of this new policy approach. Without the US's strong leadership to hold countries worldwide to the promise of the internet, the free flow of information online, both broadly and within trade negotiations, we will see the rapid erosion of the internet and we're gonna see it in the near future. Every new decision that raises a digital wall over national borders is splintering the internet into a collection of networks that don't talk to each other so easily, that don't collaborate with one another so easily, and if the US does the reverse course and do it very, very soon, we will see the rapid erosion of the internet really soon, and it's gonna have devastating consequences on the many benefits and freedoms that we enjoy on me. The United States must reassert its leadership to protect and defend the internet in policy spaces where it's at most risk. So let me wrap up by um, pointing out that um, it's really striking how broad the concern has been expressed in Washington about these, about these issues. I mean, on one end of a spectrum, you have Freedom House, um, the leading kind of authority on human rights worldwide that very, very quickly in, in um, early November came out with a very strong statement expressing real concern about this. You have um, you know, Wikimedia, um, which is expressing concern that it's not gonna be able to operate in the same way, um, or perhaps even at all, if in, if in fact there are data localization requirements and, and cross-border data flow um, um, issues. I mean, unlike, you know, folks may think that there's a Wikipedia in every little country around the world, but in fact, that's not how it's architecturally served. Um, you know, um, obviously the, um, the technology industry is very concerned about this. You know, folks from CCIA can, can talk more to that. But what's particularly striking to me as someone who's been around Washington for a long time in these tech policy debates is how broad the concern is with just mainstream American industry. If you look at um, US Chamber of Commerce letter issued um, late last year, I mean, you see the trade associations from big pharma to the entire insurance industry, to the retail industry, to um, 
to the Motion Picture and RIAA um, Association. I mean, um, you know, it, it, it is not ordinary that you have civil rights groups and, and really mainstream industry raising a concern here. And, you know, kind of why isn't there more discussion um, of this issue? Well, I, I think the reason there's not more discussion of this issue is that, is that it's not really going to impact the United States very much. Kind of no matter what USTR says, policy in the U.S. is going to be policy whatever it, it is in the U.S. But it is already having strong impacts in the United uh, around the world. And so, um, you know, if you want to follow up more on human rights, civil rights issues, talk to uh, Jen Brody is, um, where, where, it, oh, oh, th sorry, there's Jen, um, is, is um, you know, from Freedom House can talk to you about it. CCI, I'm sure has um, folks, folks here at this conference, um, you know, talk, if you're concerned about the um, economy, go talk to the U.S. Chamber. And obviously we're happy to, to talk further. But ultimately the United States, as Natalie says, it, 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 we, we desperately need it to reassert a strong support for, um, for, for, for open internet. So thanks so much.